I can split it over. Great. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for this first part of our program on land trusts and forest birds. Uh, this program is co-sponsored by Audubon Connecticut and the Kent Land Trust. I'm Connie Manis. I think I know most of you, uh, Executive Director of the Kent Land Trust, and I'll be introducing our instructors in a minute, but I wanted briefly uh, to provide some background on the Kent Land Trust and on the Audrey and Robert Tobin Preserve, which will serve as our learning site. Um, the Kent Land Trust is Kent's community land trust, which works to protect natural resources and significant scenic open spaces, farms, recreational places, and of course, wildlife and its habitat. We were incorporated in 1989 and over the years have protected over 3,000 acres in Kent, uh, including 10 preserves with trail networks. We protected the Tobin Preserve uh, in 2012, thanks to the tremendous generosity of Audrey and Bob Tobin, who live next to the preserve on its Warren side. Audrey and Bob really loved to walk the preserve's 241 acres, which are located high on a ridge at the nexus of Kent, Warren, and Cornwall, overlooking the Housatonic River and the hills and the mountains to its west. Uh, over the years, we've conducted quite a bit of work in the preserve, cataloging the wildlife there, especially its resident birds, bats, and amphibians, uh, and uh, always with the help and engagement of volunteers, in particular, young students. I want to give a shout out to a few KLT people who have been instrumental to the work. Lori Doss, a KLT board member and the chair of the Marblewood School Science Department, and you'll get the chance to hear from Lori in just a bit. Uh, Brennan and Ashley Wilkins, Ashley is on the meeting now, uh, both uh, this year's summer interns working with Lori, uh, and Brennan is a graduate of the Yukon Natural Conservation Resources Academy uh, with special expertise in aerial insectivores, aka swallows. Uh, a couple of other uh, KLT board members, we have Dana Slaughter, who is the chair of our programs committee. Uh, Jim Norton said he was going to be on, I can't see if he's on yet, our treasurer. Uh, we have Clark Gifford, who is uh, KLT's land manager here, uh, and Melissa Chernisky, our programs director. Um, Bob Tobin was meant to be on, and you will definitely meet him on the site walks who, uh, in addition to his significant role in protecting the preserve, he now serves on our board of directors. Bob and Audrey have generously underwritten this and other programs supporting environmental education in the preserve uh, in honor and loving memory of their daughter, Kelly Alicia Tobin. Thanks very much to Bob and Audrey. Um, and uh, now without further ado, let me introduce and then pass the floor to tonight's presenters. Uh, I um, already told you about Lori Doss, and uh, she'll be the next to speak. But before that, let me introduce Kelly Morgan, who uh, is based in Norwich, Connecticut, uh, but has been working closely with us and with Audubon, Connecticut, uh, actually working with Audubon, Connecticut for the past several years to coordinate and lead workshops like these. And she's gained a ton of experience uh, identifying birds and their habitats and land management strategies. Uh, it's been absolutely super to work with her uh, on this project. Um, and then Dr. Eileen Fielding is the center director of the Sharon Audubon Center. Um, I suspect that many of you probably know her already. She has over 20 years experience with nonprofits, uh, she, uh, including working as the executive director of the Farmington River Watershed Association. I uh, and um, prior to coming on board as staff as the center director at Sharon Audubon was a longstanding volunteer uh, and also on the center's advisory board. So she has so much knowledge to share with us and I'm really excited for tonight's program. Mm -hmm. So uh, now let me pass the floor to Lori Doss. Hello, um, are we gonna go with the slide? Okay, slide. Yes, down. I'm gonna try to get this going here can you all see my, from, my yeah. and then go from the current slide or from the beginning i think yeah and and this this whole section on top is blocking that uh, so let me let me try this slideshow 
If you go from the beginning, yeah, from current yeah, slide. Yeah, that should do it. Okay. All right. Good. So do you want do you want me to start with the title here or okay? Here you go. All righty. So um, for several years, uh, I've been working with various Kent Land Trust interns and students from Marvelwood School and other young volunteers, whether it be the study streams or whatnot at the Tobin Preserve. And Bob and Audrey, when they donated the preserve, they specifically um, mentioned that they wanted it used for research and to help educate others. Um, so our role has been to fulfill um, some of the scientific research needs such as we uh, have operated a MAPS wildlife station there where we mist net and ban birds uh, throughout the summer. Uh, we do some acoustic surveys with birds to help document them. We've been trying to do this also for the Connecticut Bird Atlas project that's been going on. And you know, some students have worked with me for like eight or more years. Um, one of the things it's important to document birds for grant purposes down the road. Um, they like to know what species are there. Uh, the Audubon priority birds, these are all images of birds we've captured uh, at the preserve or we photographed at the preserve. And priority bird species um, are not only the most endangered species, but they're species that are particularly threatened in terms of their long-term survival. So we wanna pay close attention to those because these are species that if we can protect and, and engage in significant <laughs> conservation needs, we can really make a difference. And one of the ways to, um, and I'll put a link in there about priority birds in the chat in a second. One of the things we do is we also um, land trust, we've helped the land trust create hotspots. And these are designated areas where you can, um, request a hotspot and you can list the birds that you've documented on the property and anybody visiting the property can then use that same spot to document the birds. And it helps you get a baseline of birds um, that are documented over time and who is documenting the species. Um, you know, there are several critical bird species there such as the wood thrush and cerulean warbler uh, breeding at the Tobin Preserve, which are birds of also global conservation concern, according to the IUCN or International Union for Conservation of Nature. Thank you for that, Lori. I'm going to move on to the next slide here, if it'll let me. And thank you, Eileen, for putting that in. She beat me to the punch, so good job for the priority bird species. It's taken a second to load. That's okay. It's fun to look at the, what you have on this list here for sightings. <laughs> and you can add pictures to this. You can add acoustics uh, to this. You know, there's technology you can use now with simple um, your phones, whether it be Merlin or BirdNet, where you can even record an, uh, 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 a sound of a bird and it'll help you identify it. And then you can actually upload that sound to your computer and then put it into your uh, mm. bird sightings. And if you, you know, if you put in and search for it, hotspots, you can then go in and see what people put in. And eBird is used by all of us. Right, and it's, and it's um, you know, it's used when they're evaluating grants and, and what species have been seen there are for important bird areas and their designation. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the birders dozen. There are 12 species that are fairly common in Connecticut and they're representatives of Connecticut's priority birds, which we just told you about a little bit earlier. A forest with suitable habitat for these species likely provides habitat for a wide range of other species. A lot of the birds on this list are prevalent in Connecticut and we want to keep it that way. Um, it, by managing woodlands for birds, we can keep it that way. We'll be sending you all a PDF of the birders dozen so you don't have to worry about taking notes or memorizing them right now. Um, we'll also look at two other birds that are not in the birders dozen, but both breed at Tobin Preserve. Often you'll hear a bird long before you see it so learning to identify a bird by its song is very helpful. BirdNet and Merlin have audio apps. So you can be in the woods, hear the bird and record their song right on your phone and find out what you are hearing. You can even find videos on YouTube 
uh, about using the app and downloading them and they're free and it's a great way to learn your birds. We're gonna take kind of a virtual walk now through the woods and we'll see all types of forested woodlands all throughout Connecticut. So right here, this habitat is deciduous forest with wetlands back in here. There's there's wetlands, a dense, thick understory and, and fields nearby. Here's a big field down here in this gully is the wetlands. Um, and it's surrounded by other stands of thick shrubs and young forest. This is an ideal area for the American woodcock. They prefer fat patches of five acres or larger so the birds can feed shifting between different zones of soil moisture. The tip of their long beak is flexible, which is really cool. And it's perfect for probing for earthworms in the soil. Shrub dominated wetlands with open fields nearby is key. If you visit this habitat really early in the spring, sometimes even February, um, just about at dusk, you might hear their nasally peen. They sound like peen, peen and you might be able to see their aerial mating flight. It is beautiful. This habitat is deciduous or mixed woods with 50 to 80% canopy cover and a dense shrub understory. The picture on the right here, you can see the mountain laurel in the understory. The black-throated blue warbler can be found in this type of habitat and they have a strong association with mountain laurel and they're very sensitive to forest fragmentation. The male and female both have this, this patch of white here on their wings, and that's called a handkerchief. Only the male is this midnight blue color, the female is a dull olive, and they pick insects from the undersides of leaves in the understory in lower canopy. The male sings to defend their breeding territory, and he very, is very aggressive and chases off any rivals. Here we've got a healthy stand of hemlock. This is during the, the fall or winter, but you can see how, how thick it is. Here's another one during the summertime and a nice thick closed canopy and uneven aged woodlands. The black throated green warbler is very likely to be found here. They can be very hard to see because they're usually high up in the canopy. They have a very strong association with hemlocks. So if you come across a black-throated green warbler on your walk, that's a really good indication that there's a healthy stand of hemlock nearby. They prefer large continuous tracts of forest with closed canopy in softwood or mixed woods. Here's an area of new growth. It's young deciduous forest. You can see the, the understory and the midstory are growing in nicely. Here's another area of nice new regeneration. And this also shows a, a soft edge or a, the stadium effect that goes into a forest, which Eileen is gonna be talking about in a little while. The chestnut sided warbler is a lover of young habitat. They'll move into these areas of new growth just a few years after a disturbance. Young habitat is key. They're easily identified by their by their bright crown and black face markings and their rich chestnut sided flanks. This bird is a beauty, I think. In the fall, they aren't this bright color, but they still will have this, this bright yellow crown on top. Their song is, please, please, please to meet ya. Please, please, please to meet ya, with an emphasis on the cha. Here's a deciduous forested area with a nearly closed canopy and an open midstory. The Eastern Peewee likes this open midstory for nesting sites, probably because they feel safer from predators, but they're often found in clearings and canopy gaps, sallying out from insects, from snags that serve as foraging porches. Canopy gaps have more sunlight, so insects can be readily found there. Eastern wood peewee is pretty inconspicuous and very hard to tell apart from other flycatchers. So recognizing their song is key to identifying them. And they, they have a very distinctive song and they say their name, peewee, peewee. Here we've got a beautiful little stream running through the forest. 
has a nearly closed canopy and there's a lot of woody debris in the understory and leaf litter where birds can find lots of insects. Or you might find a uh, uprooted tree with the, with the roots coming out that you can, um, you, you see those all the time around, around nice, nice wood, woodland areas that have streams and uh, marshes in them. When you come across a habitat with these types of features, take a minute and stop and listen. You'll probably hear the great chirp of the Louisiana water thrush. This warbler nests in cavities under steep streamside banks or in the upturned roots of fallen trees near the water. You'll see them hopping along along the rocks on the edge of a stream, and you'll see them constantly bobbing their rear end up and down. I like to think that they're doing a little dance and getting their forest groove on. They're really cute to watch. This is one of the earliest warblers to arrive in the spring, and they're one of the first ones to leave after they raise their clutch. Their song sounds like a southern bell saying, hey, 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 watch where you're going. Hey, 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 watch where you're going. Now we're in a really large block size forest with really big mature trees. There's a good supply of decaying down wood for foraging for insects. Then we find a tree that tells us for certain what bird is using this habitat. The holes are elongated and more rectangular than round. The pileated woodpecker needs a really large forest with mature deciduous woods or mixed woods and they need large trees for nesting and roosting. About the size of a crow, they're one of the largest, and most striking birds we have. This picture on the right shows the white wing bars and that's what will usually stand out when, you're, when you see one in flight. They're an excavation bird and the holes that they make are used by smaller cavity nesting birds. If you're through the woods and you find a big pile of wood chips at the base of a tree, look up and you'll probably see the handiwork of the pileated. Their territorial call to me is very loud and obnoxious and it sounds like walk, 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 walk. We've probably all heard it before. Here's an uneven aged deciduous forest with a mostly closed canopy. On the forest floor, we see lots of oak leaves. Uh, uh, the picture here on the right, you can see a lot of blueberries in the in the opening. Um, this is great habitat for the scarlet tanager who forages in the leafy upper branches. They have a very strong association with oaks and with openings in the canopy where it can fly out for insects. The scarlet tanager is also area sensitive and needs a patch of at least 40 acres for breeding. It's by far one of the showiest birds in our eastern forest, but they're also very frustrating because you can hear their chipper, chipper, and you know they're right up there somewhere, but that cherry red blends right up, bl blends right in with that bright green foliage at the top. We certainly set, spend a lot of time looking for the scarlet tanager. This is a deciduous and mixed forest with thick understory vegetation. This habitat has canopy gaps and openings that let the sunlight hit the forest floor that promotes the growth of a thick understory. The red-eyed vireo breeds in this type of habitat, and they're also found near canopy gaps and openings. Their song sounds like they're saying, here I am, where are you? Here I am, where are you? They kind of throw their voices around and are really hard to find. They're our ventriloquists of the forest. Here we've got a damp, dense, mostly deciduous woodland with swampy areas and maybe a stream. It has a mostly closed canopy with a dense understory. The picture on the right is during winter leaf off, but you can see all the saplings in here and know that when the leaves are on, it's really a, a, a thick understory. There's a lot of leaf litter and woody debris with lots of insects and the very loves this habitat. It's a small thrush that beads breeds in wetland habitat, often building their nest on the ground, on a clump of grass or very close to the ground. One of their calls sounds like their name, Veer, Veer. Here we see mature deciduous or mixed trees on a hillside or slopes. 
It's a mostly closed canopy and a shrubby understory. If you see these features on a hillside, keep an out for the worm-eating warbler. They have a strong association with slopes. The female uses its kind of drab colors as camouflage when it's sitting on the nest, and she won't move until she's practically touched. If she is flushed off the nest, she'll land close by and flap around on the ground like it's dragging a broken wing to try to divert predators away from the nest. She's a very good mama. Their song is a dry insect-like trill, and I cannot do that one at all, so you'll have to look that one up. This habitat is deciduous or mixed woods with a closed canopy and a moderate understory of shrubs and saplings and a fairly open forest floor with damp soil and lots of leaf litter. The wood thrush hops around through leaf litter, tossing it in search of insects. They'll spend a few seconds flipping through the leaves, then bob upright and look around and make sure the coast is clear, then go back down to foraging. I find that when they bob their heads up and expose that white breast with the dark markings, that's when they're easiest to spot in the woods. Wood thrush are area sensitive and in a heavily forested landscape, a patch of at least 70 acres is needed for successful breeding. The wood thrush song is my absolute favorite. I remember hearing it as a kid in the woods and I thought it must be someone playing a flute. There was no way a, a bird's chirping could sound that beautiful. Uh, their sound is kind of like ching, 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 eole. That's about the closest I can get to it. So those are the birders dozen, but we have two more birds that are more rare in Connecticut, but Tobin Preserve has habitats that they associate with. And it's so exciting that these two bird species have chosen Tobin for the nesting grounds. These pictures were taken on Tobin by Lori Doss. There's an almost impenetrable tangle of briars and brushy shrubs in the understory. Sometime you'll find these briary tangles along streams and edges of ponds or swamps or very dense thickets along margins of wood. The yellow-breasted chat has a bizarre series of hoots and whistles and clucks. The bird is uh, often hard to see, but sometimes it launches itself into the air to sing its odd song as it flies. And it's got, sometimes it'll have floppy wing beats and it'll have dangling legs. It's our largest warbler and its song makes you think it must be a cross between a warbler and a mockingbird. The yellow-breasted chat forages by searching in foliage and dense low tangles or by perching to eat berries. And unlike any other warbler, it'll hold its food with one foot while it feeds. It favors low impenetrable vegetation along forest edges and in riparian areas, power line cuts and old fields. Here we've got mature oaks, white oaks and specifically chestnut oaks on Tobin Preserve with uneven aged forest stands nearby. This bird also strongly associates with canopy gaps. I hope you've all noticed a reoccurring theme tonight with uh, the feature of canopy gaps and how amazing they are to so many birds. The cerulean warbler forages at the tops of canopies, hopping toward the very end of the twigs. Males often sing their buzzy ascending song while foraging. You really need a good pair of binoculars to find these guys, and you might have a stick, stiff neck the next day, but they're really a treat to find. This is how you usually see them. Not, not this beautiful picture in the middle, but you often see their bellies from way up high. Okay, we're just gonna introduce a Venza really quick because it's a, become a, an invaluable tool for anyone who manages woodlands. And I know I sent the link to all of you and if you get a chance to, to check out the video on, on Avenza, uh, it really is a fantastic, fantastic tool. Um, you don't need any internet connection for it and you can upload your map that you get through email. See this little, this little blue dot right here? This is a, a map of a, an area that person is on and that's the person. So you can walk in the woods and know exactly where you are. You'll never get lost. And you can take photos uh, of certain points and it'll all be saved on there. So this is the, the Tobin map. Um, that I sent all of you, if you want to upload it in there, then you can um, see where you are on the map and you leave yourself a bread, breadcrumb trail. This is a picture of a, a particular pop property from the last Green Valley. 
And this is what you would see on Google Earth. Um, that's, that's about it. But when you have a Venza and you're in the field, this is how I use it is Corey Folsom O'Keefe did a, a bird habitat assessment on this property and I help her write the reports. She sends me her Avenza info and this is what I get. I get this, this beautiful area of this, this map and I can tell where she's been, exactly what location she went to. And oh, here on the Western edge is a large area of barberry and she pinned it. And here's autumn olive over here, black birch here, uh, forested wetlands ends right here. And here's the deciduous forested wetlands. And when I click on deciduous forest wetlands, up comes two photos that she took. So I get to see, wow, look at this understory. It's a mostly skunk cabbage and barberry. There's downed woody material, which is great for forest nesting birds. Uh, there's some barberry back here. We can, she also took a picture of the canopy. So I can see that it's a mostly closed canopy and a, a mostly open mid-story. So Avenza is a really good tool. Um, you, can, you can use it to help manage your woodlands and share it with others and let them know where things are going on on the properties that only you see, but you can share it with others. So now I'm gonna stop sharing and pass it on to Eileen. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Um, you've done a great job of um, introducing a whole lot of subjects that I'm going to be uh, spending some time on uh, uh, with my presentation here. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, is really in two parts. I'm going to backtrack a little bit back to the birds and back to the situation that birds are in. Um, so I'll spend a little while on that. Um, there, are, there are lots of different ways to approach forest stewardship. If you're uh, volunteering for a land trust and you're trying to take care of, of a preserve, and uh, you, can, you can come at it from a lot of different angles. Um, Audubon obviously is, is interested in the plight of our forest birds. And so we tend to look at the forest through a bird lens. And that's, uh, that, that's how I'm going to start off. And then I will wrap up with some looks at forest features that are really going to echo a lot of what Kelly just said. So we don't need to spend a lot of time on it, especially because I expect we'll be going into the woods itself, either tomorrow or a week from Saturday. And uh, we'll be talking about those same features again in real life at greater length. So uh, let me do my own screen sharing here. You can tell we're all pretty hung up on wood thrushes, can't you? Eileen, is it tomorrow or Friday? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Friday, right? it, is, it is Friday. Thank okay. you for catching me on that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, and let me hide this so I can see my own slides. Um, okay. So we're talking about forest stewardship and a lot of people do forest stewardship and uh, with different priorities in mind, this is going to be about forest stewardship with the birds in mind. And I'm actually going to start um, with a couple of rhetorical questions. Um, but first, why, why are the forest birds in trouble? And uh, what stewardship measures can help them? That's, uh, that's the, the main thrust of this presentation. But I also want to mention that uh, there are broad benefits of bird conservation. So while this might seem like kind of a narrow focus, um, focusing on birds actually takes care of a lot of things. So. Uh, Let's start with rhetorical question number one. The forests have been around for millions of years without any help from us. So, you know, why do we feel that we have to tweak them at all? Um, if you leave a forest, uh, if you leave a landscape by itself in this latitude uh, with this amount of annual rainfall that we get, you're going to get a forest of some kind or other eventually. And if you leave it there for 200, 300, 400, 1,000 years, um, in this latitude, it's going to get complex. It will get old, <laughs> obviously patchy. The soil will become deep. You'll get a diversity of species. I say it's dynamically stable. That's, uh, that's very similar to saying that it's resilient. It responds well uh, to change without the whole system breaking down. Um, and it, and it, it's an ecological community that sustains itself. That's, that's what you eventually get. So why are we out there trying to help the forests along? And that's what I wanna spend some time here. Um, 
here are some reasons to manage, and they're fairly obvious. Um, sometimes you manage a forest for a product, timber, maple syrup. You might manage it for a result. Clean water is a public good that forests are very, very good at providing because of the way they um, break up the force of rainfall, the way they uh, filter water. Um, and you've never seen a water company that's managing its land as lawn. Uh, water companies know that forests help keep water clean. Um, you might want to manage a forest for the quality of the soils, for the game wildlife and non-game wildlife. Some of these overlap, obviously. You might want to do it for recreation, for just the benefits of contact with nature. There might be endangered species like the ones that some of the ones that we've been talking about um, this evening, whose populations you want to help out but it's not just birds. And then there is the uh, factor of storing or sequestering carbon. And that's becoming an important reason to uh, look at how we're managing our forests. All of these things can affect overall biodiversity, uh, the resilience of the forest, how well it comes back from disasters. And then there's this thing called forest health. And uh, you know that's a little bit difficult to define, but uh, there are folks who walk into forests and they don't want to see a whole lot of diseased trees or dying trees or trees that are growing so close together and competing so hard with each other that their growth is all stunted. So uh, that may be uh, what we mean when we say forest health. Over on the right, we have uh, a picture to remind me to mention to you that uh, Audubon, Connecticut actually has a guide that is downloadable. I'll, I'll share the link a little later on about uh, how you can manage a forest for both trees and for birds right here in Connecticut. So it is, it is geared for the Connecticut forest, Connecticut forest birds. Okay, so uh, what are we worried about here? Um, if we're gonna talk about uh, bird preservation or bird conservation in the Eastern US, we're mostly talking about forest birds, um, unless we're talking about coastal birds, which is another whole conversation. In Connecticut, 60%, uh, and, and in New York, 60% of the land is forested, and 75% of that is privately owned. And uh, that's why land trusts are so important, along with uh, other privately owned land. Um, the, uh, the parks and the, and the uh, uh, public preserves are not enough to take care of all bird habitat. We really need the, uh, the participation of the private, um, private landowners, including uh, land trust. So the birds, some of these birds are here only for the breeding season. Some of them are only passing through on migration and some of them are here year round. But if you take a look at about 90 of the Eastern forest birds that we know are in decline, at least a third of those are in really significant decline. And uh, this is what we mean by significant. I mean, here are some of uh, the birders dozen. Here's some birds that we've just looked at. Um, Canada warbler, in the, these are figures from the last 50 years, give or take, 63% down, woodcock 40% down, cerulean warbler 73% down, although not, not as bad in Connecticut, I will say that. Wood thrush, 59%, golden wing warbler, 60, prairie warbler, 54. These are, these are declines that are going to extinguish these birds if it goes on uh, for many decades longer. So what's going on here? We have 60% you know, of the land is forested. Um, so let's look at the condition of the forest. Yeah, we have a lot of areas that look like natural areas and a lot of areas that we consider to be natural areas. But there are a whole lot of bullets here that I'm gonna be illustrating uh, further in succeeding slides, but uh, just going through the whole list here. Most of the forest that we have is fairly recently regrown. And even before that, just to be picky about it, indigenous people managed the forest. So um, what you call natural is uh, kind of a matter of how you wanna define it. Um, the important tree species that were here 400 years ago may not even be here anymore. Some of them are just outright missing. Some of them are uh, just a shadow of themselves and uh, some of them are declining even as we speak. Um, Kelly mentioned the, uh, the space requirements of some of those core forest birds. They might need 40 acres, they might need 70 acres and the forest is in smaller and smaller pieces now. 
Um, we don't have what we call age class diversity, which is a jargony way of saying we don't have very much true old growth forest, like almost none. And we don't have uh, quite as much new forest as we might want for optimal bird diversity. We'll get back into that in a moment. Um, species diversity is, is down overall. Deer are a significant threat to birds because of the effect they have on forests. Um, and of course, we have the non-native uh, species that are invasive. Um, some of the native species can be very rough competitors themselves, and we have introduced pests. And then, of course, there's climate change. So um, what does all this do to the birds? Well, it appears to be degrading the quality of the habitat, both for the breeding birds and for the birds that are here, some of the birds that are here uh, year round. And what that results in is poor reproductive success. So the, the, the parent birds are not putting out as many successful young fledglings um, and populations are going down. And by the way, I'm gonna mention here, this is not the only threats that the migratory birds are facing because they have their entire migratory route and then their wintering habitat to contend with. And of course there can be issues there as well, but uh, we can do something here. And uh, just to make the point, um, if we're looking at this through a bird lens and trying to make things better for birds, we're also uh, affecting some of these other forest values. Uh, forests, you could make the case, have intrinsic value um, and they have value for our health and our well being. They certainly have economic value and they provide uh, ecosystem services that have value that it's, it's very hard to even calculate in terms of flood protection, clean water and now uh, carbon sequestration. And just overall resilience, uh, ability to bounce back from, uh, from catastrophic events. Okay, so um, here's, here's my little pontification here. Um, I'm quoting uh, Dr. Tom Lovejoy, very prominent conservation biologist. If you take care of birds, you take care of most of the environmental problems in the world. And that may be a little bit too simple. <laughs> might not be 100% true, but uh, it really does apply. Uh, to managing our forests so that the birds do well in them. So uh, let's take a look at some of the missing tree species. This is what chestnuts used to look like. And in some parts of the East, chestnuts were 25% of the, uh, of the uh, trees in a given forest. They were common, they were huge, and they were an incredibly valuable food source. And for all practical purposes, they're gone. And we have similar impacts uh, hitting some of our other historical tree species in, in our forest, the American elm and Dutch elm disease, the American beech being affected by beech bark scale, white pine and white pine blister rust, the emerald ash borer, we've seen that taking out our ash. We don't know what the longhorn beetle uh, is going to be doing with our maples, um, but before you get too depressed, um, <laughs> These things are not always 100% uh, disasters. I, I know that most of you know that we can uh, get out in the woods and every now and then spot a chestnut. They're not completely gone. And uh, someday we may be getting these species back uh, in the numbers and prevalence um, that we did, but it's gonna be a while before things uh, settle out. So the combination of species, tree species is not what it was. Um, and then there's um, lack of core forest. Kelly just mentioned the wood thrush's uh, forest requirements. In the wintertime, the wood thrush is wintering in habitats that are pretty much continuous forest um, in Mexico and Central America. And then they're coming up to uh, the Eastern uh, United States to their breeding habitat, which used to look a lot more like this than it does now. Uh, now wood thrushes are often coming to places that look like this. And that's probably not 70 acres. Um, there's probably nowhere in that block of trees that is really functionally interior forest or core forest. Every bit of it is so close to the edge that that's really a different kind of forest habitat. So the trees are there, but it's, it's not the kind of forest that some of our interior species need. And if you look at it this way, this is how the forest has been fragmenting. Uh, from uh, this is 1985 to 2015. So over the course of about 30 years, take a look at how the, uh, the pieces are getting, whoops, sorry. The pieces are getting smaller. 
um, and they're continuing to get smaller. And um, that's definitely affecting the quality of the habitat for the birds. And that's why we're trying to knit together or join together some of uh, the pieces that are still there so that we have continuity between these chunks and functionally they can be uh, bigger forests. Um, we've already mentioned this, the, uh, there's not a whole lot of old forest. In fact, I couldn't find a photograph. I faked it with this one. <laughs> and there's not a whole lot of very young forest. And um, that decreases the, the diversity of habitats that are available to some of these birds, like the chestnut-sided warbler or the prairie warbler that would love a spot like this. And um, the deer are a serious issue. If you were to cut a section of forest to allow uh, that, that heavy undergrowth that uh, helps to support birds to, uh, to fill in, and uh, provide that kind of habitat. This is sort of what you would want. I mean, there's blackberry in there, there's lots of oak, um, lots of other tree species coming back. But with the deer population that we have, more often an area that should look like this and be contributing to the regeneration of our forest and the habitat of our birds, we end up with something that looks like this. Um, it, it can be tough to get forest regeneration and habitat for those ground nesting and uh, uh, low level nesting forest birds. And of course, we've all seen invasive species. I probably don't have to tell anybody that this is an infestation of barberry. And again, um, this can reduce the quality of habitat and the diversity of plants that are out there because a non-native invasive will not only exclude the native plants simply by uh, taking up the space and shading them out, but it also can create what is essentially a food desert uh, for the birds because the non-native plants don't support populations of insects the way the native plants do. Our native insects are not adapted to use these plants. And so uh, the populations of insects could go down. And uh, we have seen signs of serious malnutrition in fledgling birds that are brought into Sharon Audubon Center's wildlife rehab clinic. And of course, you know, I'm not saying that we have these studies to absolutely prove it, but um, we're worried that uh, our breeding birds are starting to suffer malnutrition out there. Um, and then there's climate change. And uh, here's, here's the wood thrush again, our poster bird. Um, and here's its breeding habitat again. And I just wanna point out the areas of red on these two maps. The one on the left is the, uh, the red is the amount of breeding uh, range it would lose if our summer temperature goes up 1.5 degrees centigrade, which it is likely to do. And the map on the right shows the loss of summer breeding habitat if uh, our temperature goes up three degrees. And uh, you can see some green there. That's uh, where the thrushes may be able to expand their range but only after the forest has changed to the kind of forest that wood thrushes need. And that takes a lot longer than the wood thrush just flying there. So uh, it's something to, to keep in mind. All right, so now we're all wringing our hands and uh, bummed out about this. Uh, what can we do? Well, we're trying to improve the breeding habitat of the migratory birds um, and, and also of our year-round residents. Essentially, we're trying to open the faucet of bird production during the breeding season to help offset all these pressures on them and the many drains that uh, create population losses. And uh, we need to be doing a better job and um, hopefully we can, we can find ways to do that. So this is um, a quick romp through what quality for habitat for forest birds can look like and I am going to go through this quickly, uh, partly because Kelly's already shown lots of pictures of what works for the birders dozen, which uh, represent habitat needs for a lot of other kinds of birds, and partly because we're going into the woods to look at this anyway. So this is a, a quick review. Diversity is key, both at the landscape level. Uh, so you're looking at uh, how much is old forest, how much is young forest, how much is high upland forest, how much of it is wetland forest, and at the stand level. You want some complex structure uh, at the stand level. Because uh, if you look at uh, this diagram of what kinds of birds are most likely 
in different ages of forest, it's a little oversimplistic. Um, I'm not going to spend time on it now, but um, I'll clue you in. Some of these birds that are sitting right above certain forest ages, uh, they don't look at this diagram. They cheat. They, they move all around. Some of them will breed in one kind of forest, and then their fledglings will forage in another kind of forest. So you, you really do need some complexity on the landscape, even for these birds that might seem to be somewhat specialized. Um, so vertical structure, structural diversity. Uh, a, a solid ground layer, a solid mid-story, um, and a certain percentage of canopy. But we want gaps in the canopies. Um, the sunny patches are actually what helps foster some of the growth at the lower levels. And that way you uh, benefit a lot of different kinds of birds. You need large diameter trees. Think of that uh, pileated woodpecker and uh, the birds that need to build big nests in big trees or that need to nest in cavities. Softwood inclusions, uh, then you'll invite in things like the black-throated green warbler, but you're also providing cover for a lot of birds that need shelter during rainstorms, during ice storms, during uh, windy winter conditions. Softwoods are, are good to see. You want to, you see those in, uh, even in deciduous forest. Dead standing trees and cavity trees for all kinds of woodpeckers, nuthatches, chickadees, um, flycatchers, um, swallows, you name it. And we even have a number that we look for when uh, we're out in the woods per acre. The downed wood uh, looks messy. Some people want to clean it out. It's actually sheltering a lot of bird nests and a lot of bird food sources. Uh, the birds on the forest floor searching for invertebrates, um, again, getting cover from the weather and again, uh, having hiding places for their nests. Uh, and if you don't have, naturally occurring down dead wood. That's what brush piles are for. Um, and then there's the stadium effect or the soft edge uh, that we've mentioned a couple of times. We mention that and we look for that because uh, if you are going from flat land right into tall trees, um, there's not enough of a buffer between the, the flat open ground and the, uh, the interior of the forest. So things like crows, blue jays, cowbirds can see into the forest. They have more access to the nests of uh, breeding forest birds. So it's, it's more dangerous. Also, just the physical barrier um, buffers the effect of wind. It buffers the effect of weather. And it provides, uh, it provides habitat. Once again, this is structure that edge-loving birds can live in. And of course, we prefer it to be native species, but that's kind of a struggle. Leaf litter is a great source of invertebrate food for birds and plant diversity, shrub diversity and plant diversity, overall plant diversity is great for uh, providing year round sources of food for birds because sometimes it's buds, sometimes it's flowers or nectar or sap or seeds or nuts or fruits or insects. And all of that helps to provide a year round supply without interruptions, you know, without starvation periods. So that's my piece. Um, here again is the uh, website that you can go to to download this, and we can provide it in the chat as well. And I'm going to turn this over to Connie. All right, great. Thanks, Eileen. Um, I actually didn't know that it was going to be turned back over to me. Um, oh, I did find while you were talking the link to the guide, so that is in the chat for uh, those of you who are interested to download. Um, I know that, you know, that was a lot of information and I'm sure that a few of you have questions. Um, I think that what we wanted to do at this point was turn off the recording and open to questions. And uh, if we go a couple minutes over, 